there's something over there you can see the slides there right here so if you look there you can see the slides oh you can see the oh, oh yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. Forth, yeah yeah oh yeah that's that's uh, Good afternoon, everybody. Um, can I ask you to take your seats? So welcome to uh, parallel session number three. Uh, it's in practice, interoperability and data management in the SSH. Um, we're calling in uh, some of our speakers today and our moderator, Emiliano Delinocenti. Um, Irena, do we have him here? Hi, Emiliano. Hi, everybody. Hi, thanks for joining us. So I will uh, be in the room with you here. You are going to moderate the session uh, from uh, from online, uh, and I will keep it, yeah. keep uh, track of the time uh, for everyone here. Thank you. The floor is yours, Emiliano. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for inviting me to moderate this session, which, which in my opinion, opinion will be really, really fun to watch and see because we will be presenting some. Uh, of the results that uh, um, together with our friends uh, working in different work packages and tasks we obtained at the end of this very, very uh, enjoyable uh, project uh, during the last uh, 40 months. So I'll try to be quick and to provide you with an overview um, but I see that you, uh, you cannot see my slides yet. You are only seeing my face, so something is not going as expected. It's okay. okay. Here. So could, could you see my, my first slide? So uh, this is basically the uh, um, schedule of the session. First of all, I will be trying to give you an overview of which is the problem that uh, we will be trying to uh, solve uh, presenting our tools and services, which is uh, about uh, removing barriers. We call the barriers uh, all the stuff, the limitations based on uh, disciplinary dimensions, linguistic dimensions, and technological dimensions, but only to name a few, that are preventing uh, data services and digital resources being really accessible, interoperable uh, in a world fair. And then we will be uh, giving the floor to um, a few projects, uh, Restore, IOE, uh, Human and Machine Interoperability for Data Citation and with Data Citation, and a couple of other, the Web Panel Sample Services or WPSS and the Archive in a Box, in order for the colleagues to present uh, their way uh, to uh, remove those barriers and to open data and provide the more interoperability uh, for the resources in the um, shock uh, digital uh, ecosystem. Uh, so, uh, I already said, uh, please uh, switch the uh, slide 
because I'm seeing uh, the, the the first one. Uh, so, uh, which is uh, which are the barriers uh, that I am referring to that are um, creating those limits uh, among resources in the digital ecosystem? Uh, first of all, we have to say that our digital ecosystem which is uh, about social sciences and humanities plus cultural heritage uh, is really big, is really rich, but uh, suffers from a kind of fragmentation and suffers from uh, mm, something that uh, among uh, our colleagues is really, really uh, a problem since years. So the presence of what we can call wall gardens, or uh, if you prefer information islands, or data silos, or uh, um, such uh, um, uh, spaces where data are not really interoperable, but is confined into vertical containers. And this is mainly due to the presence of those barriers that could be technical, linguistic, semantic, etc. Uh, earlier this morning, uh, I heard Francisca de Jong from Claring uh, providing a very nice definition of uh, interoperability as an instrument to capture social and cultural dynamics. And uh, she was referring to uh, the problems that are connected to uh, interoperability as the, the diversity of data types, uh, the diversity of uh, workflows, of scholarly cultures, but also the presence of multilingual uh, um, contexts, multimodal contexts, uh, the, align, the necessity to align uh, terminology, um, uh, semantic stuff, and uh, such problems, but also uh, the uh, possibility to use uh, the clusters, uh, shock being a cluster, in order to uh, shift from this uh, uh, kind of situ problematic situation, providing uh, some uh, kind of uh, some solution. Uh, so we are now trying to present what we provide as solutions to avoid, uh, to free the data and the metadata and to let them be interoperable or fair, if you prefer to use uh, this uh, very, very popular and important notion, and to uh, avoid the limitation of the possibility to access the uh, real value of those data and resources that are most of the times related to the same cultural uh, heritage objects, but are produced in different contexts using different tools, software, standards, and so are basically uh, um, you need uh, to know where and how to really access everything that you know in order to represent the history, uh, the, the deep uh, uh, meaning of those objects using all the possible point of views provided by uh, the different disciplines and so on. So, uh, a few examples of those uh, research uh, questions, uh, because we are uh, scientists uh, after all, so we are working with the research questions uh, that are affected by the presence of the, those barriers are related to the possibility to at once uh, have information about the tangible and intangible aspects of such objects. Um, so, for example, I am not interested in uh, uh, knowing uh, how to get uh, to um, five different uh, databases that are uh, providing information about, uh, for example, a manuscript. Uh, from the perspective of uh, a codicologist, which is interested in the object, and uh, on the other end, uh, from the perspective of the uh, philologist, which is mostly interested in the, uh, um, so to say, intellectual aspects of those objects, I'm not into it because uh, I'm interested in research. So I need to use my time not to know 
everything about this fragmented uh, um, ecosystem, but to access the data that I need in order to carry on with my uh, uh, research. So this is the example that I provide, I'm providing you being a um, medievalist uh, as, a, uh, as a training. And so you can consider it as a physical object. Uh, uh, and so you can have uh, multiple questions about the um, tangible dimension of it. And you need a number of tools, a number of uh, databases and stuff in order to go on with your research. But you can also consider it as a cultural uh, witness. So you are interested in its contents. And so you also need to know uh, where to find these other uh, uh, available uh, information. Not to mention the transnational, the multilingual and the uh, dimensions and the possibility to also access a number of contextual uh, uh, resources such as uh, uh, secondary literature, uh, other catalogs, uh, uh, bibliography and uh, other um, available research. So in real world, those objects, a manuscript, for example, are a mix of uh, uh, tangible and intangible features. So is at once res cogitans and res extensa. So it's everything is intermingled. But most of the times, cultural heritage objects are flying island documents, so are separated. So you need to know how to navigate in this complex, fragmented uh, digital ecosystem in order to get your research done. So our goal was to get the most out of the work being done with uh, um, with shock in order to remove those barriers and promote a culture of interoperability for our resources in order to fully represent this complex body of knowledge in a connected and interoperable way in order to provide access to all the platforms and services for data discovery analysis management across disciplines across contexts across technologies and uh, strengthen and reduce the fragmentation of this uh, um, social sciences, uh, humanities and cultural heritage digital ecosystem. So we uh, prepared and we um, developed uh, those tools with uh, this uh, research workflow uh, in mind because interoperability is a process, is not a product. And so we passed from ingestion to analysis to mapping, passing from to storage and then providing access. And you will see what I am talking about in the examples of our colleagues in just a minute. I will skip those slides because I already used my 10 minutes. And so I can only say that you will see something like this passing from a remote uh, uh, this uh, uh, um, resources that you have to uh, reach uh, in separate uh, manners using separate uh, websites and stuff like the example of restore that will be presented by my colleague. You will not uh, um, you will not have to know uh, anything about the fact that is in the archivio di Stato di Prato, uh, you don't know anything about uh, the fact that you, uh, they are using uh, different standards, you only have to know that you can pass from a situation where you have the mm, tangible and intangible, the different linguistic and technological dimensions all represented uh, in uh, the separate manners into a world uh, we, in which all those dimensions are uh, deeply interconnected. And so you can uh, 
information objects and information islands last slide that you can see uh, now after uh, this one which is the um, representation of the 3D model provided by the colleagues at IOLI. With my uh, introduction, I am now giving the floor to Carmen Di Meo, which is going to provide an example of this uh, uh, problem solving activity that uh, we had in shock, presenting the Restore project. Carmen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Emiliano, and good afternoon to uh, everyone who is joining our session today. Um, if you can uh, share my presentation. OK, thank you. So uh, I'm going to present today Restore, which is uh, our uh, data integration suite, uh, which uh, involves many uh, data communities as we uh, worked basically within the uh, WP9, the work package 9 of shock, which uh, was dedicated to data communities. And the data communities we address with our platform are social sciences and humanities, and um, with a, a specific uh, uh, interest, uh, a cultural, cultural heritage and heritage science. So um, next slide, please we are going to see our uh, landing page from uh, where it is possible to uh, access our resources uh, which were uh, basically data sets produced um, and provided to our project by uh, different cultural institutions uh, that we define as GLAM so uh, basically archives libraries uh, museums so we collected a lot of uh, uh, cultural, cultural heritage artifacts, uh, uh, which were um, uh, uh, very different as uh, sources and uh, digitized materials. Uh, next slide, please. And here we have um, uh, uh, an overview of the uh, workflow we elaborated that goes from the uh, ingestion of these uh, very uh, different data sets uh, in themselves. And uh, we uh, tried to develop and to offer a, a model of working with the uh, data sets, which, which are very different. Uh, and uh, our workflow uh, allows from the data storage, uh, and uh, it is something that was developed also with working together with cultural uh, institution and uh, offering uh, uh, technological support uh, to, to them so we can store uh, all the data which are uh, different and we can also provide access to the original resources but uh, resources that are uh, actually uh, mapped and modeled and made uh, uh, interoperable and um, uh, next slide please these are the basis uh, from uh, which we started working. So we had uh, archival material, we had museum objects, and we add textual materials such as uh, various uh, corpora of text or um, uh, corpus of letters. And we tried to uh, overcome what, what was the real problem, so a lack of interoperability between different cataloging systems. We had very different output um, uh, uh, from the, uh, the beginning, the initial phase of our work, and we tried to elaborate uh, a workflow that allowed us to um, extract the basic uh, semantics, uh, either implicit or explicit, that were gathered um, within this uh, information that uh, um, provided by the data sets we had and tried to uh, extract the concepts that were at the basis of this very different uh, material. Um, the uh, um, uh, lack of interoperability we observed was also related to catalographic standards. 
uh, that are indicated within the slide. We have different um, uh, standards from our uh, resources. For instance, the EAD and EAC model are referred to uh, archival material, and we have uh, uh, different cataloging systems used within uh, uh, our research centers or uh, museums uh, and cultural institutions in general. So uh, our workflow, next slide please, was based on a custom parser, which are easily adapted to um, uh, very different standards and formats of, uh, um, that were uh, um, referring to the digitized materials. So from the original XML source, we were able to uh, elaborate a uh, custom uh, tabular format for the data we had. Uh, that was the basis of a, um, a further conversion from the, uh, for, uh, from the original sources to uh, RDF triples. So um, that was the format that uh, allowed then the uh, final conversion of the data into sources that there are, um, uh, which are uh, ready for publication and different visualization options. So this is based on triples. And next slide, please. So um, the uh, um, kind of mapping we we did uh, on the data is focused on three uh, basically three um, uh, uh, core entities, which are uh, uh, anthroponyms toponyms and uh, uh, spash, uh, space and time coordinates. So this was our mapping phase. And then we uh, modeled all the information we had according to the CDOC CRM logic. And in this respect, I shall refer to the shock contest in general. Uh, we benefited also from the work done in other work packages. Uh, and for instance, the CDOC CRM we know is the shock reference uh, ontology. So we worked uh, according to the international standards that also the shock project um, uh, in a way selected. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. Here uh, we have a sample of all the places we were able to map, and these places were mentioned uh, within different data sets. Uh, and uh, the other image shows the relationship between anthroponyms that we are now uh, able to, to show. And um, next slide. Okay, we uh, developed within the platform uh, several um, um, endpoints uh, from which uh, resources are uh, accessible. We have a Spark UL endpoint, uh, a, a facet browser, and uh, we also have different um, visualization options, that, uh, including the load live, which is the best form uh, that represents the um, uh, modeling phase we, uh, we've done according to the CDOC CRM model. And I'm going to show within the next slide um, an example of uh, our uh, advanced research bar that um, uh, allows for the selection of collection you want to browse. And uh, either all of them, because uh, as, as I said, uh, all our data are um, actually uh, uh, in interoperable. And next slide, please. If you can see, uh, yeah, the video. Now I'm going to show a sample of uh, the launch of a research through our platform. Uh, okay, something uh, is not okay. So we searched for the Arno, which is a toponym, uh, which is the Arno River in Tuscany. And these are all the documents that are connected to this uh, toponym. 
within all the data sets. We have a data citation function that uh, goes back to the original source. And these are the um, record entries we uh, realized within the platform. Uh, from there, you can access the load live visualization of the resources that are actually showing the physical object connected to an information object. And now you can see and explore all the uh, data we um, were able to, um, to map and to model. And uh, uh, according to the sources we have, from the archive and the uh, museum um, objects. And this is, of course, based on the CDOC CRM uh, logic. Uh, we can uh, actually switch on to the next slide. Okay, so again, we uh, can see what kind of options we have developed for the browsing and visualization of our data, plus the uh, reference to, to the original sources and each uh, that are stored um, and digitized by each uh, institution. Yes, thank you. We can go on. One minute, Carmen. Thank you. Yes, so this is the uh, latest improvement we are applying to our tool. Um, we are integrating the platform with a um, virtual uh, exhibition tool, which is called Movio, that uh, um, uh, allows for the visualization of stories. So we are working on data storytelling, uh, and this is, uh, of course, a service which is um, uh, intended for uh, multiple um, uh, users. Uh, so not just the people who are experts of the uh, domains of reference, uh, uh, people who know uh, what to search and how to search collection, but also general, more general users that can uh, actually browse and navigate the stories connected to the data we integrated. So uh, as, as for instance, in this entry, uh, we are seeing a person who uh, had a real uh, great impact uh, for the economic history throughout the 14th century, not just uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Prato, which is the city uh, of Italy um, from uh, which uh, all, all the data sets come, but also uh, which had a great impact for the history of um, uh, uh, commercial, the commercial aspect uh, 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 in Europe, and this is uh, this will be very uh, made visible through the uh, storytelling. Uh, um, uh, we are uh, uh, actually giving within our uh, platform, and uh, last but not, not least, I should just give credit to the collaboration we had within Task Nine. Point four with the uh, CNRS team that developed IOLI. Next slide, and uh, which is uh, going to be presented by my colleague uh, Adeline. And basically, this was uh, really uh, what shock uh, also offered to our team. So the possibility of sharing two different perspectives of the same cultural datum. Uh, we uh, um, work, we elaborated a strategy uh, that allowed us to really collaborate using our two different tools. Uh, so Restore and IOLI, Restore providing uh, a data set, and we saw a um, sample of our um, uh, data integration uh, within the slide that Emiliano showed us before uh, that um, uh, cultural uh, heritage objects that were connected to our Getadelli database that was worked within the, um, annotated within the IOLI platform. So uh, this, is uh, this was a real, uh, a very important collaboration framework for us uh, within the two tasks. And um, 
we can go to the last slides. I wish to uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, uh, as I said, we worked with, uh, based on the same data sets, a selection of data from the Jetta Delhi data set. And uh, I wish to thank you all for your attention. I, I guess my time is finished now. And I shall leave my uh, yeah, I shall leave my floor to the Emiliano, one second, you're muted. Can you unmute? Sorry, I was uh, I was probably muted. I was saying that uh, I thank <laughs> Carmen, of course, for providing me a link uh, to present uh, the work of uh, Adeline Manuel, working at the uh, French uh, CNRS uh, and uh, presenting us uh, with the I, uh, uh, the IOLI platform. But before uh, letting uh, her have the floor, I invite all the people uh, connected to uh, to provide remarks or ask, or ask uh, questions using the web form that they have at uh, their disposal the chat the web chat so that we can continue the discussion for uh, uh, after the presentations so now adeline the floor is uh, yours yes uh, i'll share my screen first. So if you can see my screen. Yes. Yes. OK. Uh, so thank you, Emiliano. So um, I'm here today to present IULI, which is a reality based read annotation cloud platform for the collaborative documentation of cultural heritage um, artifacts. Uh, which is developed here in uh, CNRS um, in Marseille. For many years, the development of digital uh, of uh, digital technologies has produced important results in the collection, visualization, and indexing of digital resources. As these advances have made it possible to introduce new tools that are making documentation practices evolve within the cultural heritage community. The management of multidimensional and multi-format data um, introduces new problems and challenges. In particular, the development of relevant analysis and interpretation method, uh, the sharing and correlation of heterogeneous data among several actors and contexts, and the centralized uh, archiving of documentation results for long-term preservation purposes. So despite the different approaches and tools for observation, description and analysis, um, the actors of cultural heritage documentation all have a common interest and central focus, the heritage object, the physical one. So whether it is a site, a building, a sculpture, a painting, a work of art, or an archaeological fragment. This is the starting point for the development of IULI, a reality-based read annotation platform, which allow a multidisciplinary community to build semantically enriched 3D description of heritage artifacts from simple images and specialized annotation 
coupled with uh, additional resources. So our approach puts the heritage object, so the physical one, at the heart of the documentation process by considering reality-based 3D and semantic description in a strongly integrated way. So our solution is to create an informative continuum at all phases of the documentation process from the acquisition of image and spatial data to semantically enriched 3D representation based on three fundamental features. The first part is to create a bridge between the real object and its digital representation by introducing a solution for memorizing spatialized annotation made by different actors. Based on uh, spatial overlapping factors, our multi-layer description model allows the simultaneous structuring of data and geometry, as well as the continuous correlation of semantic annotation. To ensure the accessibility to the application, even from in-situ remote areas, um, our platform is built on the cloud computing service, allowing the gathering, processing, and sharing of 3D data of semantically enriched 3D data within online and on-site documentation scenarios. So this platform introduces an original informative linkage between the physical object space and its digital representation by facing two interconnected, interconnected technical issues, the on-site retrieval of structured information according to the physical object's annotation, and uh, the on-site collection and processing of new data to be spatially referenced and semantically correlated with previous data. So this is done by integrating the following features. Firstly, an incremental image-based 3D spatialization process to manage the geometric merging of several images coming from different actors at different temporal states. Uh, secondly, a 2D, 3D annotation framework enabling user to draw, visualize, and register relevant surfaces um, surface regions by handling simple 2D images, uh, specially oriented around a dynamic 3D representation. And finally, a multi-layered morphology-based data structuring model to accurately uh, describe real objects in all their geometric complexity and according to multidisciplinary observation through a flexible data model allowing to organize semantic information um, with a set of freely structured user descriptors and the automatic extraction of geovisual descriptors. So from our first prototype of the application, we opened in 2018 a beta testing campaign that gave us the chance to have real world issues and having users coming from a lot of different usage um, the aim of this program was not only to pinpoint uh, technical difficulties, but also to collect feedback on the features and discuss um, the issues and the challenges of the data sharing. And starting from these feedbacks, we engage in task uh, 4.6 of a short project, the development of the new version of IUD. The new version of IULI has been developed while maintaining the core functionalities of the first version. A redesign of the architecture has improved the robustness of the platform as well as the possibility to deploy it on a larger scale. And numerous uh, features have also been introduced in order to facilitate the use of the platform and to offer new tools for more varied um, description scenarios of cultural heritage objects. Um, the multi-user aspects in IOLI platform is central, uh, so the interface for the user and users was adapted to a social network-like approach. Uh, in the settings, users could set their discoverability called visibility, which could be uh, either public or private, to enable the other users to see them within the community. Um, this setting will allow the users who would like to remain invisible to do so, while giving the opportunity to the others to share their works 
to some or all of the other users. Um, collaborative projects can be defined by two categories of settings, the sharing and the visibility option. The sharing option allows specified collaborators to open the workspace and use the application to annotate regions, describe layers and regions, and consult the project. One um, minute, Adeline. Adeline. Huh? One minute, thank you, Adeline. Ah, okay. The visibility options allows anyone with an IOLI account to access any project set to visible. Uh, these two settings are satisfy the IOLI requirement to offer a collaborative framework that both respects the respective confessionality constraint that gives the chance to decimate one's work for new cooperation uh, opportunities. Uh, collaborative projects mean multiple actors that have each their own semantic specificities, whether it is related to their domain or natural languages. So contra controlled vocabularies are one solution to this terminology variation that can cause misunderstanding between collaborators and data indexation confusion. Um, controlled vocabulary are implemented in IOLI through uh, an already existed web-based multilingual thesaurus management tool dedicated to the management of vocabularies called Open Teso. Um, the aggregation of several and diverse data by the format and nature within IOLI requires a data scheme that will provide a complete set of descriptors adapted to each specific domain related to the cultural heritage objects. This is essential for the indexation, research and, research and retrieve of all the data. For this reason, one of our main activities was the important work on the data structure integration in the formal ontology that are the CDOC CRM and its extension. <clears throat> the, the sharing and dissemination of an annotated project within a community is a crucial issue for the IOLI project. Um, that's why we develop a specific viewer uh, called Spritz. Um, to allow the sharing and dissemination of IOLI projects on a wider scale where users do not need to have uh, an IOLI account to, um, to see projects. And uh, for at last, um, in order to offer users the possibility to use IOLI easily, um, several interoperability issues have arised. The main, the first one is about um, the tool used in uh, IOLI for uh, the photogrammetric reconstruction. Uh, in IOLI, uh, it is based on the Micmac, um, um, it was based on Micmac, which is developed by IGN. But as MetaShape is widely used in the cultural heritage community, a script for converting Mic MetaShape data to an archive respecting the Micmac data structures that can be imported into IOLI was therefore implemented. As IOLI does not allow you to add certain types of information uh, where other platforms do, we thought to enable the linking of IOLA, IOLI data with other information systems. And in particular, as Carmen already uh, said about it, we work on the interoperability of data between IOLI and um, Restore, if we, even if we don't have time to fully connect data within shock. But the aim okay, is to capitalize then, on the you, possibility of first by the two platforms. I so, it's sorry finished. to interrupt you, but we are very, very strict on the timing. But uh, I thank you for your very nice presentation and for the citation of our collaboration. And to provide a link for our French colleague Nicolas, uh, working at uh, CNRS uh, and representing uh, here Daria, talking about uh, two um, important forms of interoperability between human and machines. And so I leave to Nicolas and to Cesare, which worked uh, uh, as a collaborator on this uh, uh, project to present their solution for another 15 minutes. And sorry again for interrupting you, Adeline. So, Nicolas, the floor is yours. Emiliano, uh, so I'm going to be quick because we are strict on the time. 
So uh, we switch the photo because I don't think it's very useful. Well, well, what we have done so far in shock is not really to produce data and to produce annotation like it was done before. It was more on a, when it's finished, you know. When it's finished, what can you do with your data? You need to cite data. And so we were a little bit naive at the beginning of the project, I think. So I'm going to show where the, the journey we have done around data citation and how we try to facilitate the, the work of the researchers and research projects to cite data, but also to retrieve data to use them. So data citation is in SSH, there is nothing really, really specific uh, for the goals. You can see that everywhere. We want to give visibility, we want to reuse, we want to be fair, we want to be everything. So, but there is maybe something new in SSH. This is the context that uh, now there is a few development. It's really the beginning of data papers, data journals link between data and publication and this is something that we need to address and to be able to cite data properly and also to cite and to associate data and publication properly so what we have done we have done a sort of survey of different practices in uh, citation in ssh and we were horrified no not really uh, but it was terrible to see that there are a lot of recommendations, they have a lot of uh, requirements uh, f coming from previous projects, for instance, DASISH, uh, coming from different institutions, uh, the W3C, for instance, but there are no real standards, especially in SSH, to cite data. So do we have time, did we have time in a shock to propose a standard? Not really, but we're trying to facilitate things and to try to, to give practical response to this kind of uh, questions. So I just show you two examples of uh, data citation. This, the first one is a very traditional one that you can find in an article. The second one is more structured, but you see this is the same information. So for humans, maybe the first one is better. For machines, the second one should be better. But it depends, because this is what I'm going to show. It depends on what you put inside your structuration, how you structure. For instance, an author, depending the discipline, is not always an author that in history is not the same for in linguistic, for instance. So this is something which, is, which needs interoperability, because this is a session about interoperability, so we need to, think, to speak a little bit about interoperability but also to be very practical and to try to, to find your way around all the information you have already and also to be ready to uh, cite properly your data and to give visibility to your data after your research project is finished. So what we have done so far, we have done, as I just told you, an inventory of practices and then that led to provide some recommendations for specifically targeted at the SSH community, and also to review, based on this recommendation, 85 repositories, and thanks to uh, task 8.2 of shock, we have the list of 120 repositories, so we have a choice. And it was very, very useful, and with all this work, you can see all the, the arrows, we were able to feed the data prototype, which I I'm going to present afterwards, and to be able to adapt it for the needs, again, to be very practical. The recommendation, I'm going very quickly on that, we try to not reinvent the wheel. We, we know how to do that in SSH, but this time we try not to reinvent the wheel. So we based everything on first 11 recommendation, and we adapted the uh, recommendation for the SA needs, specific needs of SSH. And uh, so you have the explanation why this principle, how to do it, and the expected outcome. So you can uh, check that, and it was published by the Church Project huh, on, the, on the Zenodo um, 
repository. And you can see that the toaster, Edward Gray, was uh, associated with uh, this part. Huh? We also, based on this recommendation, try to see if the repositories used in SSH in general was in phase with this recommendation. So we check a lot of things, for instance, the PID. Oh yes, the magic PID. I'm going to, speak, to say more about the magic PID. Presence of the landing page. Okay, it's good to have a landing page, but can you do something with that? And what you can extract from the information based on the PID, you have a landing page. Do you have something to extract for machine and for human, by the way? And also, do you have a ready to use site as feature in the repositories? And we test also the use of the content, well, the standardization of the content, the interoperability of the content. Do you use vocabul standard vocabularies? And uh, do, you do you provide also versioning? This is very important, but it's not very, very uh, often that you can find that. And also the presence to related uh, publication, because this is something which is very rare right now in a uh, SSH um, world. So we have done this survey. We spent a very nice summer to just to test all the repositories, you can imagine. And uh, so the result is uh, we have some room for improvement, a lot of rooms for improvement. OK, we have PIDs, but PIDs are not always the magic things that you can imagine. Uh, PIDs, you have different different PIDs, DOIs, which are now the sort of norm. You have handles, but sometimes the information provided by the registration agencies or provided by the handles are not very well structured. Sometimes they are not accurate. There are some errors with the authors and this kind of thing. And also the site size is something which is not really, really uh, easy to find. Uh, in the in our survey, and to finish with that, we need to really provide very well structured information, and so machine can grab that, and also humans can use that to bring to build a very better citation and give visibility to SSH data. In astronomy, for instance, it's not a problem. They are used to that for 40 years. They have procedures, they have vocabularies, they have everything. In SSH. We have room to improve. The prototype. Uh, so you imagine that uh, after we discover that we need to have several sources of information, we developed, and uh, thanks to Cesare for the developing, we developed this prototype to try to grab information from different sources, from PIDs, of course, from registration agencies, but it's not perfect, landing pages, Sometimes it's less from perfect. You have nothing to use in the landing page. There's sometimes a title, sometimes nothing, sometimes no structured information. And we also try to, uh, thanks to the list of repositories, we often have the information for the description of the repository is refree data. Maybe I pronounce the French way, sorry. And so we can have an access to the API and try to get to grab additional information. And so it's a question of interoperability. We put that in a, a standardized way and we provide information, this information through an API and also a citation viewer for human. So this is basically what we have done. No? You have an idea of the architecture of this prototype, but it is not the subject today. And then you can see, for instance, we get information from the registration agency and we get information from the landing page. And you can see sometimes it's not the same. And sometimes we get other information from the API. So this is something which is, it was unexpected for us, but this is something we need to address. And we try to address that with the prototype. So we give access to this information with the API of the prototype. But remember that we have toasters, humans, and they need to access the information also to, when you try to retrieve, for instance, a data set, you, you need to have all this information in the same place. 
and this is the citation viewer that you can uh, you can see uh, a very very uh, it's not very um, there are not a lot of metadata in that one but this is the way you can see all the information we get from uh, the different sources we spoke because I know that uh, Emiliano uh, likes the idea of machine interoperability and human interoperability. So about the specific part of interoperability and citation, you know, it's not really easy, as I told you, to cite properly something. Because you need to grab information, you need to be able to present the information the right way, and you need to have a, an entire ecosystem for that. You need to have documentation, norms, norms that mean vocabularies, a way to structure information. Now it's a little bit messy, but you have some standards, emerging standards. You have also to need, a need to have repositories and trusted repositories, for instance, certified repositories. And so this is why we recommend, we develop this recommendation. And also we have done this survey of repositories to have, uh, to provide information to researchers about how to cite and where to put their data. You know, the survey of repositories was not meant to give a, a hallmark to all repositories. Huh? It was just to have a general view of what a repository should or could uh, present and could provide uh, regarding citation. And on the other way around, when you are looking, you are in the fair and you want to reuse, you are looking for data, and sometimes it's not easy to find. It's not easy to find the context of the production of the data and to find also the goal of the production of the data. So this is also some information that we try to grab from different sources. And also we envision at the beginning of the, of the project that we will be able to provide a, a sort of interface to give you the possibility to annotate and uh, for humans to annotate and to enrich the citation and the information we have about data set. And you can imagine that this is a way to prepare data papers and then data journals. So this is what I saw about this topic about human interoperability. About machine interoperability, we have an example because we try to, uh, to do a graph of all the information we grabbed Nicolas, sorry, two more minutes. Yes, it's, I will be, I'm, I'm perfectly in phase with you, Emilia. So I'm building graph, so you are in the same, uh, on the same line. And so we try to build some graph to try to link citation uh, by authors. It's not very easy because sometimes the authors can be doubled and you, you, have, some, uh, you have some errors and so on, linking with keywords and so on. And so we have people who are trying to uh, use the information in the prototype. And they first, they try to grab information with machine learning from different sources, like papers, for instance. And then they try to find information in the prototype to harmonize and to build a graph. And so we realize that even if we have a standardized way to provide information, Sometimes the, the content is not that good and it's not enough to build a reliable graph. And uh, so we are also, we, we can say, I can, I'm going to finish with that. There are a lot of work to do to be able to build this graph, but also to have even a good citation of SSH data. I'm finished, Emiliano. Thank you. You were great, uh, both as a presenter and uh, as a time saver, because uh, uh, we have uh, one minute uh, left uh, saved. So I will uh, end uh, the, fl the floor to uh, Jean-Bierre Michaud and Gianmaria Bottoni that uh, will be presenting the WPSS uh, uh, service uh, and so the floor is uh, uh, yours please thank you emiliano uh so uh, just a moment Jenny. i j and just need to share the screen can you see the slides yeah thank you very much so 
Managing a sample is a common need for longitudinal surveys for the SSH, as well as other fields. There are many survey platforms on the market, but they like some essential features and flexibility that, re that researchers could expect. Here are the main ones. To collect sur survey research data, we need an information system that its users can trust with minimized data flows and user types defined on a need-to-know basis. To do so, we designed a decentralized information system where data <laughs> is handled in a privacy compliant way. The whole service has been carefully designed to be GDPR compliant. Please, could you change the slide, please? One more. <laughs> And one more. Thank you. Collaborate. The second need is a centralized management of survey fielding and orchestration. Six different user types have been defined to collaborate. Each one is granted restricted access to data. Another important requirement is to be able to mix more than one mode of contact. In this case, for each panelist, a mobile phone number or an email address should be available. The tool should allow to send all kinds of messages, either by email or short text messages. The tool should also, and that's very important, be multilingual. This feature has been designed from the start with this in, in mind. Languages can be added at any time, of course. Questionnaire messages and help text are translatable. A language is set at the individual level, meaning that more than one language can be used for one sample. And on the other hand, one language could be used by more than one sample. To do so, the European Social Survey, ESS ERIC and Sciences Po have been collaborating on the long run to agree on the tool specification, this was our first shock deliverable, and to minimize constraints and maximize flexibility. Next slide, please. A proof of concept has been tested early, feedback has been collected, and several iterations have been made. Last but not least, we did include training and support for the stakeholders. We opted for a twofold information system. On this view, you can see how the information system is split into a survey, a commercial survey platform called Qualtrics, and the software that we developed called WPSS. WPSS interacts with Qualtrics through an API. Users are granted either access to the survey platform or to WPSS. For example, the survey coordinator doesn't need to connect to Qualtrics. On the contrary, uh, a translator uh, isn't aware of WPSS. The rationale is as follows. Actions are triggered from WPSS and carried out on Qualtrics, while content is managed from the survey platform. Next slide, please. Next slide. And I will skip the one, this one to go quicker. Uh, next slide, please. The survey coordinators, coordinator sorry, connects securely to the WPSS to get a bird's eye view of the study components and trigger actions. The first action could be to check the list of available surveys on the survey platform and that have been shared with Qualtrics. And we can see that a shock 2022 survey pops up here. Back on the survey platform as a message editor to create, to create sorry, a source email, including placeholders for the panelist first name in this case and for the personal survey link. Not that feature to allow preloaded data has been implemented in the project. I will also invite trans as a um, source message uh, creator, I will also invite translator to collaborate on the, on the message. Note that uh, short text messages 
are managed in a very similar way. Uh, this is a view of a translator on Qualtrics. A translator can now type in and preview an email translation. Of course, uh, placeholders need to be untouched. Next slide, please. As a st study coordinator again, back on WPSS, I can see that messages are available for use to distribute the survey. Next slide. Now I change uh, my persona and I will be uh, a sample manager, meaning uh, I have been assigned a uh, 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 panel for France, and I can log in on WPSS and find help anytime. I can look for online help on our wiki uh, anytime. I can also populate my sample by importing a sample CSV file as many times as desired. The C is CSV import file will be first checked for validity before the real import happens. Could you skip to please? When questionnaire messages and translation are ready, the survey coordinator will create a set of individual survey links to be distributed using message deliveries. A delivery uses a main communication channel, either email or short text message, and a message content. A fallback mode could, should, and can be chosen for panelists who only provided either mobile phone number or an email. Let's get an overview of the panelist's experience now. As a panelist, I receive an email invite in my own language to enter directly the shock survey using whatever device I fancy. This first scenario does not require at any time that the respondent, the panelist, logs in. On this second scenario, next slide please, the survey coordinator could push panelists to log into the panelist portal in WPSS at some point. The panelist can then access an available survey from within this portal in one additional step. Next slide. As a survey coordinator, I can follow up deliveries output at a sample level. I can monitor in real time delivery issues by, for example, looking for emails outbound. Next slide. The sample manager can access a similar detailed view. Deliveries issues can be spotted early as a push for action. In this case, calling panelists for whom email bounced to try and get a valid email address. Next slide, please. Survey coordinator on WPSS can monitor response rates as well with sample level, level indicators. Next slide. Whereas each sample manager has access to individual response statuses. Once the field work is over, the archive staff has access to pseudonymized survey data on the survey platform. This is the only role who is granted this access. So as a conclusion, let's wonder what kind of barrier, barriers sorry, did we remove or at least displace? during this uh, project. First, our, one of our main goals was to look for standardization and interoperability by design. We designed a tool for the SSH and beyond. We stick to standards and open formats. To give you an idea, imagine a facility that ingests localized files in more than 20 European languages. I mean, there is no way that you can convince a random citizen to answer a survey by calling him or, or her by a set of characters, including question marks, because uh, her first name was not, her or his first name was not uh, properly uh, written, rendered. We released, uh, furthermore, we released the source as open source, open source code. 
uh, the code as open source, sorry. We also looked for sustainability using a control technical stack, uh, controlling coverage, and using uh, easy Docker containers for easy deployments. Where interoperability is mainly a matter of early design decisions, tackling data quality is more like the results of repeated efforts. These efforts include, but are not limited to user training, users training and support, sample contact data validation, and uh, survey data uh, quality control. And last but not least, metadata. Metadata are first class citizens in this project. Because as you know, data without metadata is of no use. As a conclusion, I will only highlight how much both EOSC and Shock Marketplace are a great use to show, showcase such a tool uh, that is um, usually uh, more hidden. Furthermore, uh, WPSS is being used within Kronos 2 uh, project, your uh, H 2020 project, to manage the cross-national sample and distribute surveys uh, for um, uh, Kronos 2 uh, waves. Uh, Kronos 2 is going quite well, and the preliminary result that you can uh, show here, uh, that we can see, sorry, here, are promising. Response rates are usually quite uh, uh, high, and um, for uh, 10 and um, soon to be uh, 12 participating countries. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Geneviève, for being so clear and providing you a great uh, uh, story of uh, uh, removing uh, barriers in the social sciences on a linguistic uh, and, uh, let's say, not only uh, linguistic, but mostly on this dimension. And it was really interesting, but uh, now uh, we will be giving the floor to uh, the last uh, uh, but not uh, less important example of removing barriers that will be explained by Marion Wittenberg uh, um, and is about the archive in a box. So Marion, the floor is uh, yours, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you. Um... Can I have the slides on, on the screen as well? Yeah, thank you. Um, I will present the work of task 5.2 about the archive in a box based on the data first software. But first I would like to acknowledge the partners who are part of the task 5.2 team. We have partners of four ERICs in our team. CNR, ISTI, which is part of ERIS, University of Göttingen and Potsdam Supercomputing and Networking Center, who are partners of DARIA, the Arctic University of Norway, our CLAN partner, and the Austrian Social Science Data Archive, and DANS, the Dutch National Center of Expertise and Repository for Research Data, both partners of SESDA. And these are the people behind the organization. So it's not the organization themselves, but it's a big group of people who developed and gave training about the data first software. What did we do within task 5.2? We adapt the open source research data repository software Dataverse to the needs of the social science and humanity communities in Europe. Already a lot of developers worldwide contribute to the development of the Dataverse software. What were, what were our goals? Adaption of the software, but for the, furthermore, to develop an archive in a box, an easy distribution which institutions without much technical staff can download. We also develop a cloud version of this for the ERIC level, for ERICs who would like to maintain a technical service for small institutions. 
What did we adapt? A lot of European institutions would like to have a user interface in their own national languages, and some have even legal, a legal necessity for this. So we developed workflow to translate the user interface, and we also gave training during the shock project for using this workflow. We worked on inclusion of metadata standards, especially the SESTA metadata model and the Claren CMDI metadata. We developed a plugin for controlled vocabularies and plugins for external services like taver taver Taverna workflows. And furthermore, we worked on the integration of Claren language resource switchboard and the Apache superset. The archive in the box software package is available for downloading and usage by institutions who would like to manage a research data repository for their designated community in their own technical environment. The idea, idea behind the archive in a box is simple. It is an automatic installation and setting up of the complete infrastructure without any extra efforts. This would lead to lower operating costs and less human resources to be committed by the institutions. And these are the components, and uh, there's now no, no link, but oh yeah, there's the link there. So these are the components. So normally my colleague uh, Slava, who is the technical lead of uh, this work package, would, could tell you a lot more about this. Um, for me, it's a little bit more a challenge to, uh, to to explain all these technical uh, components, but the idea behind is that these components work together and, and make the archive in a box a really uh, a suitable tool for institutions to use. We think the archive in a box, uh, we are breaking down barriers. With the archive in a box, we can build dataverse distributions adapted to the needs of a specific community. For example, uh, there, the, the Claren archive in a box is a little bit different to a CESA Claren in a box because the metadata schemas differ. But the technical uh, uh, backbone, the technical uh, um, um, infrastructure is the same. We only use different components. A distro is a collection of software components built, assembled, and configured so that it can easily be used as a turnkey form of free software. Dataverse-based distributions for research communities of CESA, Claren, Daria, and ERIS will have their own metadata schemes but use the same Dataverse technology. Interoperability. The archive in a box advances interoperability. It is suitable for various metadata standards. It makes use of external controlled vocabularies and the Dataverse Semantic API allows for an easier transfer of metadata to and from other systems. My colleague Slava Tikhanov had a very inspiring presentation last week about Metaverse for Dataverse, building a collaborative machine learning platform for a Dataverse network. I've put a link and I, I, uh, I, I imagine that the presentation will be shared so you can look at it uh, later yourself. I put a link to the slides because we don't have time to really uh, go in depth about these uh, future uh, ideas. But we think that the archive in a box will contribute to a network of linked data repositories in the future to break down the silos. Thank you. Thank you, Marion, for providing uh, uh, such an inspiring overview of the Dataverse tool and also to opening to uh, future uh, steps in order to enlarge uh, the notion of removing uh, barriers. So uh, we have now uh, something like 10 minutes in order to collect uh, feedback uh, from uh, the audience uh, and to uh, ask to their questions uh, if, uh, uh, if any. So uh, please, uh, if uh, there are questions or 
you want to provide your remark on what you just heard, now is your turn. Thank you. Thank you. I had a question for um, uh, Nicolas Larousse uh, about uh, the presentation about data citations. Um, and uh, the, the experience that you described uh, sounds very familiar because I've, I've come across the same uh, problems uh, when we tried uh, in Work Package 9 uh, uh, to work with uh, the construction of a knowledge graph, uh, linking data on the one hand and publications on the other hand. Now, if I go back in time, some say 40 years, uh, and I look not at data citation, but just at publication citation, then we also lived in quite a different world as we live today. Uh, they were far less systematic, far less complete, uh, much more ad hoc uh, and individually composed, individually by the author in question. Uh, that has changed. Now, the question is, why has that changed? On the one hand, uh, because of the investments and the efforts uh, made by uh, library consortia and, and librarians, but on the other hand also by the efforts of uh, publishers, and particularly publishers of scientific journals, to not accept anymore a manuscript that doesn't live up to standards. Now, in your presentation, you talked about all kinds of stakeholders, and you talked about having looked at what repositories do, have you looked at what publishers do and what they perhaps could do? Because even now today, when I look at uh, 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 what publishers actually accept as manuscripts with data citation, then they accept that they don't even come close to what is possible with uh, an approximate standard today. So why shouldn't we also put some pressure on publishers to help us out in this respect. Okay, so we we mainly concentrate on uh, publication of data sets. So, okay, we use some publication. We, we pass, for instance, uh, we use uh, the last DH conference. We use all, we pass all the papers to, to try to grab uh, citation from the papers. And so we discover that it was not normalized, as you said. And, uh, but we, we didn't do a, a lot of job about uh, publication. So maybe this is the reason why it, it's lacking in my presentation. We really concentrate on the data set and how to cite a data set. But I yes, think- that, That's what I mean. Yeah. But citation of data sets can be improved tremendously, even oh, yeah. with current situation, if big consortia like Elsevier and Sage were put their weight behind it. So there, there, is, there is already, uh, okay, people who are interested in citing data sets are funders, for instance, and uh, they are also interested uh, at uh, the visibility of data set to fund repositories, for instance. So this is an economical view, uh, but F considering Elsevier, for instance, they already bought, uh, ah, uh, I don't remember the name, uh, Mandalay, the Mandalay platform. And now when you publish something on Elsevier, they motivate you to put your data on Mandalay and they even give you some rewards if you put that on Mandalay. That means that I think that editors now they are interested also in data because they see a potential uh, uh, richness and a potential uh, possibility of selling this data or having this data is something very important for them. So things are evolving, but for me, the, maybe some disagree in the, in the room, maybe the, the future evolution it will be with uh, data papers and uh, also with uh, actionable papers. That means that for, you use, for instance, a Python notebook and then you publish your article and then somewhere you push a button and you can redo uh, all the calculations you have done, all the treatment you have done. It's just the beginning, but this is something I, I can see with my colleagues, for instance, in France, which is developing a lot. I'm not sure I really answered your question, but uh, I tried at least. 
Thank you, Nicolas. This is also opening uh, to something that uh, probably is already going on in other projects. Uh, uh, I can speak about, uh, for example, Restore, which is using uh, uh, Python scripts in order to actionate data and metadata, Jupyter notebooks and stuff like that. And so I am very much agreeing with you that this form of enhanced publications could uh, represent one of the ways to look uh, in order to foresee uh, a possible future for our uh, publications. Uh, so if uh, is there anyone else uh, uh, that is uh, willing to ask uh, something to our presenters or to provide remarks or experiences, please, the floor is yours. I think there are no questions at this moment, Emiliano. I think. So this is now the moment to wrap up. I really thank uh, all the speakers uh, and uh, all the persons working with the speakers, uh, which uh, are the um, people that made uh, all these uh, uh, happening during the 40 months of our nice collaboration within Shock. Shock produced a really shockingly amazing, great tools in order to provide for researchers what they need in order not to lose their time in finding another uh, tool, another standard, but to do their own research with the support of the tools, not being forced to use tools, but being motivated to use tools. And the EOSC and the marketplace and all the context that have been introduced and described will be our, uh, uh, our landmarks in order to uh, fully, uh, uh, to fully um, so to say, uh, uh, implement the digital turn in social sciences and humanities and cultural heritage. And I very much hope that from uh, shock as a project, uh, we will be uh, uh, able to create shock as a cluster, as a community, as a strong network of people willing to work together, to develop together, and to make uh, research uh, advance together. And so I thank you once again, the organizers, the funders, and all of you uh, there in Brussels. Uh, I really regret not being there. And uh, uh, I close here uh, thanking again the organizers for letting me moderate this session. Thank you and see you in the next project. Thank you, Emiliano. Thank you all for, for being here, thanks. Um, the next item on the agenda is networking with drinks and interactive fun with our online guests. This means that we have come to the moment that we want to do the quiz. We are waiting for the other room to come here. Uh, and in the meantime, I would like to ask you to prepare your hat because we want to take the picture all together. So we were thinking to take the picture first and then we ask you the, the quiz uh, out of practical, uh, practicalities. Thanks. Uh, just a few moments till the other people join as well.